Okay. All right. Now we got a yes. Are we good? Everybody good. All right. I'm going to move forward like we're good. Let me know if there's more problems. It's fine. All right. Hey, we're back. Okay. It's some with Twitter because I've tried streaming on twice on Twitter now and it just like it kills. So, all right. Well, hey, hey you know, I'm, I'm back with you guys at the very least. Okay. So wanted to talk about a couple details from this injury report that Matt LaFleur acknowledged in his press conference today. We'll get to Devondre Campbell, but AJ Dillon, first and foremost, uh, they're continue to test out that thumb. LaFleur acknowledged in the press conference today that with last week being a short week, they really didn't have the opportunity to get that many live wraps or reps with a wrap on his thumb to see how it would hold up, whether he can carry the ball, whether he can take contact, et cetera. This week, with it being a more standard week, they have more opportunity to do so. So we'll get a real evaluation of A.J. Dillon's chances as we progress throughout the week. As for everybody else, yes, Jaden Reed now does have a toe injury, adding to the long list of injuries that Jaden Reed has. So Lafleur said that he is one tough dude, and he continues to play through anything. So my expectation is we'll continue to see him out there. As for Christian Watson, no real update offered about the wide receiver. But one guy not listed on this injury report that there was a little bit of positive news that came from Matt LaFleur is they're taking it day by day with Luke Musgrave, and he did not rule out a potential return by the end of the season for Luke Musgrave. So a little bit of good news with the injury report today. So, all right, let's catch up on a couple of comments, and then we'll do Devon J. Campbell. Uh, better Scott, Merry Christmas to you as well. Thank you, sir. And Chris, hello, Chris. Merry Christmas to the Bard Town Brewers Nation. Merry Christmas to you as well. So, shall we talk to Devondre? Let's talk Devondre Campbell, right? It's the big topic of the day and the last couple of days, really. And if you haven't seen anything about this, good for you. But basically, on Monday, of course, the flu announced that they would be retaining Joe Barry. The plan was through the end of the season, at the very least. And then we've learned since then that they had uh, an all-defense meeting uh, on Monday morning with Joe Barry. Uh, supposedly, it didn't exactly go great. And then also since then, there's been a, uh, it was either entire defense or entire team, just open air meeting where the players could air their grievances and the coaches would just endure <laughs> and, and and that kind of situation, right? Somewhere in amongst these developments, Devondre Campbell put out this tweet. Not going out my way anymore, and I'm not playing through injuries anymore, because when it shows wrong, they always use it against you. I'm treating everyone accordingly and giving them the same energy they're giving me. Focus on yourself and your mental. 59, you owe it to yourself. So then everyone's like, oh, oh, is that a shot at fans saying that he should be cut? Was coaching staff, is it just a shot at Joe Barry and Lafleur for keeping Barry? Is it just a general, like he feels like the scapegoat of the terrible defense because frankly, he didn't exactly play well? Like their op options were endless, right? Well, Lafleur's press conference today is the first time that we've really heard from any individual since that tweet. And at his press conference, Lafleur said he understands Devondre Campbell's frustration. And keep in mind too, Lafleur and Campbell are very close. That was one of the rationales for Campbell signing here years ago. But then uh, we think it best to try to get his body back because we know what type of player he's been. We DNP'd him today to give him an opportunity to get his body back. Lafleur also mentioned that they're basically going to give him until the end of the week some time off to get his body back and then see where he's at. Yeah, okay. I mean, that doesn't really fully answer everything, but basically Lafleur is saying, hey, I know Devondre Campbell. I'm not worried about him firing off an emotional tweet affecting any of the young guys. It's not setting a precedent in the locker room for guys not to play hurt anymore. Right, so we're just going to give him some time off, clear his head, his neck, and then we'll reassess at the end of the week. So then Devondre Campbell came in about 90 seconds before reporters are booted out of the locker room following Matt LaFleur's press conference. Devondre Campbell comes in and Devondre Campbell basically just walks in. And of course, all the reporters go straight up to him, ask him about this particular situation. And he goes, I'm not talking about anything from the Internet. You want to talk about Carolina? We can talk about that. Bro. So he drops the tweet. And now, granted, he doesn't owe anything to anyone. He can tweet whatever he wants, right? 
But still, he drops the tweet. His head coach answers for the tweet. And then when it's Devondre's time to talk, then it becomes, nope, we're on to Carolina. He also went on to say this, and I thought some of these quotes were incredibly interesting. This is from Ryan Wood. Uh, the question was, is the group altogether entering this Panthers game? And he says, we're making strides right now. It's Wednesday. We like the game plan, so we'll see where we go from there. Or here. Are the issues fixed? Well, we're talking about it. So we'll see if they're fixed. <laughs> okay. What stood out on film review? It's just communication. That's it. Everybody on the same page. A lot of the mistakes that happen don't happen. Is it lack of communication a coaching issue? No, it ain't about us knowing what to do. We knew what to do. It's just about everybody on the field talking and being on the same page. Hi, yeah, yeah. So here's my stance on all of those quotes from Devondre Campbell. I think it's it basically could be as simple, or in conjunction with why did Matt Lafleur decide to keep Joe Barry? If Matt Lafleur went to a bunch of his defensive leaders like Devondre Campbell and said, "Are you happy?" Campbell goes, "Mm mm." Lafleur says, "What's the root of the problem?" And then a bunch of them say communication, of course, game plan, I'm sure, is a part of it, whatever. Then you can see LeFleur just kick back and said, well, if we adjust and fix the communication, then we'll be fine. I'm not defending the decision. I'm not saying it was the correct decision, but I am offering a potential rationale if that's what he was getting told behind the scenes. Regardless, I think we all can acknowledge that something's got to change here, right? And that might have been just an emotional Campbell's tweeted emotional stuff before. Like he's gone after fans before on Twitter. This is not the first Devondre Campbell cryptic, like take it, no disrespect from anybody type tweet. Like we've seen that a lot from him actually. So this wasn't like new. Here we are. <laughs> it's just, it's just where we are in this. Right. And then of course him refusing to talk about it. I so let's just move on from Devondre Campbell. By all accounts, it still looks like he's going to play this weekend. They're just giving him a couple days off to just chill out, let everything come back. And, and I would expect too. I don't expect Joe Barry to completely abandon his principles, but I think we're going to see something a little bit more aggressive against Bryce Young and company. Just by default, I think we're going to see that kind of development. So uh, there you go, everybody. That's the, that's the Devondre Campbell stuff that's going on. Let me know what other questions you got. Peter, bonjour, John. Bonjour to you, Peter. Jaden Reed is one of two NFL players to record 100-plus rushing, multiple rushing touchdowns, multiple 50-plus yards receptions, 500-plus receiving yards, six-plus receiving touchdowns. Guess who's the other one? CMC. Yes, indeed, Peter. I saw that tweet as well. And yeah, I mean, massive kudos to Jaden Reed. He's quickly becoming their do-it-all guy for the offense, right? Like, a little bit... Uh, Randall Cobb feels such like a lazy comp because they're both slot, but I mean that in the regard of Cobb could spring big plays. He could return. He could come out of the backfield, right? So I'm not saying they're the exact same player, but the thing that is similar between a Randall Cobb and a Jaden Reed is they both fill or can fill multiple places on the offense. And no matter what Jaden Reed has been asked to do this year, through a myriad of injuries, he's just toughed it out and gone to business. It's, uh, he looks incredibly promising for several different regards. The entire young offense does. Tyler, hey, Tyler, how you doing? Campbell's tweet was weak. It's week 15, man. Everyone is playing banged up. He makes too much money to want a pity party on Twitter. He had one great season and the rest of his career has been subpar. <sighs> yeah, I mean, over the last, like, 2021 was that all pro year, right? And then last year, he did battle a number of injuries. He was open about that on Twitter, again, on Twitter. Um, and he was average, above average, inside linebacker. Certainly not teetering on the all-pro that he was in 21. And that's much of what he's been this year when he's played. And he does have a big cap number tied to his play, as we all know. I guess if I had to take issue with this whole thing is... No. Does he owe an explanation to anyone? Nah, it's his personal Twitter. You can do as you want. But to drop that and then just be so closed off about it, not even explain it, not address it, not in, just, just move right on, basically leave your head coach out to dry to have to deal with it? Yeah, I don't like that one bit. I don't like that. If you're one of the leaders in the locker room and you're going to come out publicly and say that kind of thing, then stand by it. Or just say, it was, I don't want to get into specifics here. But it was a very tough day for me. It was an emotional reaction. Right now, our focus, 
as a team is winning out and getting to the postseason. And we're going to talk about that. That would have been better to me. Tyler also saying when Goot signed both Campbell and Douglas, I thought it was a mistake signing them based off of such a small sample size. One worked out and one didn't. Yeah, now you've got Douglas in Buffalo continuing to be PFF's highest graded coverage corner in the league. Like I get the Razul trade, but yeah, kind of funny how that all works out, doesn't it? Dan saying, who's the communication coordinator? I want that person fired. Whoever it is sucks at their job. <laughs> no, I mean, realistically, like it does to some extent in this case, because as Tyler points out in the next comment, Campbell's the one who wears the green dot. So the green dot guy is kind of the on-field communicator coordinator. Like that is a part of it. Campbell may wear it. If Campbell's off the field, then Quay wears it. So those two guys, both coming off of a very difficult game against Tampa Bay, are largely responsible for the on-field communication. Because basically what happens is Joe Barry has all of his assistants, consultants, etc., all essentially relaying their information to him. Then Barry makes the ultimate play call. If Lafleur wants a certain thing called, he's got to get that into Barry before the play call is made as well. Okay, so all that stuff happens before all this going back and forth. Then Joe Barry makes the call. It goes in through the microphone into Quay or Devondre's helmet, and then that is relayed to the rest of the players on the field. Any adjustments from there on out in terms of what actually happens in the development of a play, what happens if there's motion on the other side of the field, et cetera, et cetera, really does fall a lot on the players. So now the one thing I will say, obviously there were communication problems, but at the same token, let's not pretend as though the scheme would have worked even if the communication were perfect. I saw something earlier. I didn't pick this one out to kind of put on here, but I did see one earlier that like the average amount of separation from Chris Godwin to another Packer on all of his catches was four yards. The Packers didn't even try to stop getting the ball to the Buccaneers leading receiver. And that's, that's a joke. That's not going to work no matter what. Chris, Chris, thank you for the Superman chat. And thank you today and always, man. I walked out of Walgreens smelling like I left Quagmire's house searching for some perfume from my mom. I'm running out of my ideas three years. I get it. Mom's are tough. Maybe some flowers, Chris. Maybe, maybe. Uh, or a picture of you. <laughs> Mick, Ben Sims is open for a touchdown with the number three tight end and the number one quarterback and get the practice snaps to build familiarity by next season with three capable tight ends and all those wide receivers needing practice snaps. Well, Mick, it does depend a little bit on how they kind of divvy up the roles because I got to believe Josiah DeGuara, his time in green Bay is probably running short. Uh, he's a free agent at the end of the year. Got to believe he's probably going to be moved on from given his usage to performance, etc. Right. Okay. So now who takes on that H back role? What role does Musgrave take on? Because green Bay doesn't just have a tight end position. Every single one of their guys, yes, while technically playing tight end, fills different roles on the offense. And sometimes, yeah, there's crossover because you don't want to get too specific because then the defense knows what's coming. But ultimately, they all do pretty different things. So it kind of depends just on how large of an emphasis Ben Sims' role is in the offense. If he takes over the H-back role, yeah, then quite possibly. But... If he's just like truly the depth piece tight end and is kind of redundant to the other guys, yeah, no, then Love and Sims are not going to get that many reps together because the preference, like you said, will go to the upper depth chart tight ends and wide receivers. Tyler John, what did you make of Rashad Mendenhall's black versus white Pro Bowl tweet? Oh my God. Low Q is super entertaining compared to what the Pro Bowl is now. All I got to say is CMC would be running for his life. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's the conversation around that has been just patently absurd, especially coming from Mendenhall. Um, but uh, yeah, the immediate thought that I have is uh, team no color would probably be able to throw pretty well, but uh, CMC's running for his life. Joe, wow, I'm catching alive. Yes, you are, Joe. Welcome, welcome. Peter, Joe Barry is the one to blame for so many defensive flaws, but even more infuriating to me is the way he underuses Van Ness, although that kid is clearly rising up. And I will say, too, his snap count is on the increase. Um, 
we have seen more LVN as of late, which just happens to come in conjunction, maybe chicken and egg, with more production from LVN over the last really three weeks as well. In terms of exact playing time, like whether LVN plays 40% of snaps versus 70% of snaps versus 20, whatever, his position coach does have a very large say in that that's not exclusively Joe Barry. Not defending, just clearing that up a little. Jason Rebrovich is the pass rush coordinator or pass rush specialist, I think is his official title, as well as being the edge coach. So he does have quite a bit of say there as well. Dan, hello, Dan. We hear so much of the different rooms meeting. DL room, linebacker room, DB room. Do they also meet all together? I hope so. Yes, they do, but it's not nearly as frequent. So this does vary per week a little because, you know, when you get like stuff mixed in there with Thursday night football, Monday night football, like it does change the layout of the week. But let's just say a totally standard week. More than likely, they're meeting with their inner position every single week day, right? Like maybe that's even how the morning starts, depending on how the floor is structured the days recently. You meet with your small group. I don't know as if it's every day, but generally speaking, at least once a week, then they also do a full side of the ball meeting. And sometimes they even do full team meetings, although that's kind of a rarity. So to answer your question, they do meet collectively as a defense, but probably not as frequently as just the position groups themselves. And to my understanding, that's pretty standard fare league-wide. Uh, I don't think that that's an exclusive to Green Bay thing. So, Tyler saying Rasheed Walker has improved recently compared to how he started the season. Love it. Are you surprised Yash has fallen off so far from where he was two years ago with getting regular reps? Ultimately, yeah. It was kind of baffling, too, after Bakhtiari went down, that it was so exclusively Rashid Walker's job. Like, And then Walker had to really start struggling for Yash to get on the field at all. And the assumption coming into the year was, yeah, Rashid Walker's improving, but like, Yash is still the swing talk. Tackle, he started a bunch in the last couple of years. Everyone's been very, very quiet in Green Bay about what happened to Yash. But something did. And I don't know if it's a behind the scenes thing. I don't know if he just radically forgot how to play, but something happened there. And yeah, like you said, Rashid Walker over the last three weeks, I believe he was uh, PFF's highest rated tackle from this last week, certainly in the top three. He's playing phenomenal football over the last three weeks. I don't know as if they're comfortable yet saying like, well, Bakhtiari's not retained. He's the guy, but he's playing great. As for what's going on with Yash, I think his time in Green Bay is pretty well done. Mick, will Luke Tenuta get healthy enough to play snaps to finish out the Bears matchup? Well, I mean, he opened up his 21-day window today. He's been practicing in Green Bay with the rehab group for boy, the vast majority of the season. Um, it really depends. Uh, that's almost impossible to say given that we don't know where exactly in his injury he is, and Matt LaFleur has not called out to Nuda directly or said anything in that regard uh, about how he's doing. So maybe, I mean, they opened up the 21-day window. You would think if there's no shot, why even open that up, right? Maybe just to get in practice reps, it's really the only rationalization you can offer. But they did open up that window. I would say that that's the glimmer of hope. I just don't know how likely it is, to be honest. And I'm not sure anyone outside of the team doctors really do. Tyler, Dobbs feels like he's forgotten about in the offense the same way in which Aaron Jones does. Makes me mad. Yeah, you know, I will say, and I think a big part of the reason for that is when you've watched all of these other wide receivers progress, like Jaden Reed, kind of the do-it-all, right? And Wicks. Wicks seems to be like a specialist at getting open, especially against zone. He's phenomenal. Where Dobbs tends to struggle is in getting separation from his coverage, especially, yeah, I'd say more so in man. So that a lack of separation is going to lead to a lack of targets. The nice thing about Romeo Dobbs is he is incredibly relied, reliable when thrown the ball that he actually comes up with the ball. 
I think ultimately, I think there's great potential for us to move into next year. And this isn't meant as a slight at Dobbs at all. It's just kind of where they are right now. I won't be shocked at all if moving into next year, we basically see Watson, Reed, Wicks as the top three. And then Dobbs is your supplemental, just to make a, an easy comp, like James Jones, when he gets open, he gets the ball. But the difficulty is getting the ball kind of like your number four guy. That's what I could very well see coming for Dobbs. I would be intrigued to see Dobbs utilize deep more often like he was collegiately, which Green Bay just seems not to really use him in that regard much at all, which that I find a little surprising. Dan, how do you think the D is going to respond this week? Carolina's weak offensively, very. I'm hoping they come out and crush it after all this turmoil. Is it possible? Yeah, totally. See, here's the thing. Okay, like they had that open air meeting, and I got to believe that it was one of those where the players got to air all of their grievances saying, hey, you're putting us in positions to screw us. We want to go get the quarterback. We want to play downhill. Defenders always want to play downhill. And you're not allowing us to do so. And that's setting us up to fail. It's making us look bad. So this week, we want to crash. Joe Barry is very, very strict to his principles. But in the past... When he's been offered a commandment from the floor, it's always a temporary little change, but little things do change. I think what we're going to see this week, I do think the defense will come out and perform. I do. I think if they come out and play as soft as they did against Tampa, then Barry will not survive the last three weeks of the season. Then I think Lafleur just moves on. So... Peter, week after week, Wicks is slowly but surely turning into a future strong wide receiver number two over Dobbs and a great draft steal by Goody. He reminds me a lot of a young Devontae. Agree. I actually do, Peter. Um, he's extremely physical. His route running is incredibly elusive to keep up with, let's say that. And he seems to just have a knack as to knowing what his quarterback needs. All of those are Devonte traits. Where he may, and I'm not saying he's going to be an overall better player than Devonte, but where he may quickly ascend to being better than Devonte is as a run blocker. Because that was one thing that was pretty clear over the last few years that Green Bay or that Devonte just didn't love doing was run blocking. He was fine at it, but yeah, it wasn't great. Wicks as a young guy seems more than willing to get in there and mix it up. So. Yeah, I, as I said earlier, I could see Wicks really sneaking into a true every down starting role next year. Wouldn't wouldn't surprise me at all at this point. Mick, schemes Dob open so small Reeves. Oh, Reed takes fewer hits. Um, I mean, it can't hurt. It of course it's more complicated than just like saying let's scheme a guy open, right? Part of it is the usage for Jaden Reed. I mean. When you're a wide receiver running a jet sweep, you're going to take hits like a running back does, whether you're built like a running back or not. And that game two weeks ago where they called it like it was a, in final, I think it was like eight or nine jet sweeps. Well, you basically set Jaden Reed up to take eight or nine running back hits in that game. That's less than ideal when you're talking about a little guy. Um, so. Can they do some things to help alleviate Reed's hits? Yeah, totally, 100%. Is it going to fix it? No, that they can't do. That part of that's just the nature of what he's good at and how they use him. And that's that. And hopefully, you know, hopefully what we're seeing from Reed is he's a rookie who's adapting to NFL life. And that means he's going through the bumps and bruises that he may not suffer every year kind of like even a young Debo was for the 49ers in that regard so all right everybody thanks for being here today it is time for me to jump I got a little guy to go pick up so hope you had a great Wednesday I'll be back on Friday previewing Packers versus Panthers but then remember no watch party on Sunday may just hop on live after the game for like 15 minutes if I can get away from family oh hey oh we got two more all right I'll do these two John is it okay as a Packers fan to be nervous to play against Carolina Okay, yeah, I'm not nervous about Carolina. They're playing at the point where, like, would I be shocked if they lost Carolina? No, and I, I am, however, fully expecting them to beat Carolina. If they don't beat Carolina, 
yeah, then it's time to rip some walls down. And like, we, we got rebuilding to do in a lot of different ways. Tyler, uh, if, when Barry gets let go, who's on your short list of names? For me, it's Al Harris killing it in Dallas, Jim Leonard and Dave Aranda. Yeah. Aranda isn't doing well at Baylor as the head coach and killed it as UWDC. I'm actually, yeah, I uh, I saw Justice Mosqueda on uh, Andy Herman's podcast talk a little bit of Aranda. I thought that was brilliant. Someone, honestly, that I hadn't really considered. Not just Al Harris in Dallas. Um, how about Joe Witt Jr.? Now, I know he and McCarthy are, like, attached at the hip, so I don't know as if he'd actually leave McCarthy, but he's their pass game coordinator. He's Al Harris's boss. So if we're going to give a lot of credit to Al Harris, we better also give it to Joe Witt Jr., not to mention all of the very strong ties that Joe Witt has in Green Bay. So that potentially, and he's trained in both 3-4 and 4-3. So maybe one name to keep an eye on. Another one, uh, I may do a whole video on candidates soon, so I don't want to give everything away. But one guy I can give you, one guy that would be on my short list would be Larry Foote. He's one of the co-defensive coordinators, basically, for Tampa Bay. Everywhere he's been and his coaching staff. He has just ascended since retiring from football. Looks like a great young coach in the making. So I could get with that. Peter, last one. DeVito and Mayfield were named Offensive Players of the Week. Thanks to Joe Buried. Could Bryce Young be down? No. God, I hope not. All right, everybody. I am out of here. Go have yourselves a great night. I'll see you on Friday. And last but not least, as always, go Pack Go.